Hi, thanks for joining me. Today we're going to talk about the anatomy of low back pain and why surgery for low back pain often doesn't work. Spinal column is composed of about 30 bones, which are called vertebrae. Rising from the vertebrae are 31 sets of spinal nerves. The spinal nerves are represented in this model of the spine in yellow. The spine is divided into five major regions. These include the cervical region, the thoracic region, the lumbar region, the sacrum, and the cossacks. Most low back pain originates in the lumbar region. This is because the lumbar region houses some of the body's strongest muscles and they provide a fulcrum or a lever for the body's trunk. Meanwhile, the thoracic area provides a support system for the body's rib cage, and the cervical area provides a support system for the neck. We can see here that there are seven cervical vertebra, 12 thoracic vertebra, five lumbar vertebra, and then the sacrum and the cossus. The pelvis, which includes the sacrum and the ilium, provide the stability for the bottom of the spine. Here we are looking down onto the front of the pelvis as though someone were sitting across from us and we were looking at their midsection. The main components of the pelvis include the two ilium at the top, the sacrum in the middle, the pubis symphys at the bottom. Now the two ilium at the top can be felt above the hips on the outside. And the cossacks can be felt just above the anus at the bottom of the spine. Here's a close-up of the sacrum, with the foramen detailed. The foramen provide an escape for the nerves out through the sacrum. Speaking of nerves, we can see in this diagram the spinal cord and the nerve roots coming off of the spinal cord and through the vertebra. The prevailing theory of low back pain is that these intervertebral discs become damaged and they may protrude or otherwise lose their cushion effect and that causes the vertebra to clamp down upon each other and irritate the nerve roots. Should the disc herniation worsen, the disc may rupture. That's called a ruptured disc. In this next model, disc herniation is represented by the red area. Herniation can theoretically be caused by dehydration, injury, or a lack of good nutrition. Disc herniation or rupture is often diagnosed with either X-ray, CT scan, or MRI. The physician will often determine whether the disc is herniated or ruptured by the position of the vertebra. Spondylitis also may occur. This is an inflammation of vertebra in the lumbar region. Ankylosing spondylitis is a form of arthritis. Spinal stenosis may also occur. This is a narrowing of the spinal canal, and it often occurs as a result of arthritis. Spondylolisthesis is when one of the vertebrae slips out of position. This is also referred to as a slip disc. When lumbar pain radiates down to the legs and the feet, this is often considered radiculopathy, which is an irritation of the nerve roots. When the intervertebral discs become ruptured or herniated, a physician may refer to this as degenerative disc disease. There are several different types of low back surgery. The most popular surgeries are either disc fusion, disc laminectomies, or discectomy. Spinal fusion connects two or more of the vertebrae together permanently, while laminectomy removes part of the actual vertebra bone, while a discectomy will remove part of the herniated disc. However, the research shows that many back surgeries fail, and a 2006 study found that low back surgery didn't make a difference after two years. Furthermore, a study published in 1994 found that 64% of those with no back pain had bulging discs and 28% had disc herniation. These are folks with no low back pain. These two studies and many others bring into question the entire hypothesis of conventional medicine regarding low back pain. Consider this diagram. This diagram shows the vertebra stacked on top of each other. What's missing from this illustration? Let's look at this next diagram, which is a cross-section of a vertebra, and the facet joints where the nerves arise from. So what's missing in this illustration? The varied muscles, ligaments, and tendons 
that are holding these bones together. If these illustrations represent what conventional doctors look at and consider when they think about low back pain. Now let's look at the same cross-section inclusive of the musculature that is surrounding the vertebra. Here we can see the psoas major, the obliques, the transversus, the sacrospinalis, and other muscles that surround and support the vertebra and basically hold them into place. This next illustration shows the complexity of the musculature that not only holds the vertebra into place, but also connects the pelvis, the sacrum, and the entire trunk system together. This is a complex system of muscles, tendons, and ligaments that support the entire skeletal structure. Let's consider how muscles work. Muscles can contract or relax. Every muscle in the body is balanced by an opposing muscle, which contracts when the muscle relaxes and relaxes when the muscle contracts. When a muscle contracts, it pulls on the joint, and when a muscle relaxes, it releases that joint. This opposing counterbalancing musculature system provides a levering system throughout the body, allowing the body to be stressed in one area and relaxed in another. This creates muscle balance and allows the body to lift heavy objects and otherwise exert itself in miraculous ways. When the muscles that support the trunk are in balance, they provide stability. Let's look at what instability can cause. Here we see four different forms of scoliosis. While all scoliosis is not caused by muscle imbalances, we can easily see how a lack of musculature support for the spine can change the curvature of the spine and its ability to support the spinal column and the nerve roots that arise from the spinal column. Because most of the body's muscles are interconnected in some form, therefore imbalances from muscle groups throughout the body can have direct or indirect effects upon the supporting muscles of the spinal column. These next two illustrations show the variety of muscle groups that not only support the trunk but the spinal column and the associated supporting muscles throughout the body. These muscles illustrate the levering system of the lumbar region and how that interacts with the pelvis and hip region muscles. The abdominal muscles provide a fulcrum for that levering system because they counterbalance and counteract those muscle groups that align the spine. It is for this reason that physical therapy for low back pain will often focus upon strengthening the abdominal muscles, which are also referred to as the core, and exercises that will help provide strength, support, flexibility, tone, balance, and engagement for those muscles ligaments and tendons that surround the spine, the vertebra, the pelvis, the sacrum, the hips, and all of those other regions of the skeletal area and the all-important spinal nerve and those roots that come off of the spinal nerve. Illustrating the potential for success for this non-surgical strategy, a 1987 study found that 98% of ruptured or herniated disc patients were successfully treated with tensile myofascial therapy.